heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Three Angels Broadcasting Network and the South England Conference present London 2016. This evening we find ourselves during to the close of our two-week campaign and every evening has been an evening where we've been exposed to the Word of God in a deeper way. And we're very grateful for Pastor Lo Kang for his ministry here. And I just see the hands of those who appreciated the messages as they come to us each night. Amen. Tonight we have another important message, the judgment hour. And I believe that we're going to be reminded tonight that once we have Jesus on our side, we have nothing to fear for the judgment. But before Pastor Lo Kang comes, we're happy to have... For the first time here in Croydon Church, Neville Peters, we welcome him this evening as he sings for us. Mine. 
Then face to face We'll be together God and I My Lord and I Jesus and I in a holy time. We could have the closing prayer right now. Amen, Amen again. Amen. Paul Lee and Neville Peters have set the stage tonight for the proclamation of this message. I'm already moved. I think the Lord just said to me, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. Thank you, Brother Neville. Thank you, Brother Paul. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me. We need the Lord this evening. Loving Father in heaven, you never disappoint. And we invite you again, Father, tonight to come and to speak to our hearts. Each one of us is in need of an infusion of holiness for such a trying hour in which we abide. And we pray, Lord, tonight that you'll stop by Croydon, that you will connect our world audience from whatever continent they view this message. Send your spirit to be the active power in their hearts and in their minds, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My soul is so watered already, I feel like I could just have the closing prayer. But God has given me a message for tonight. Some of you are stressed about the title, The Judgment Hour. But I'd like to begin my message with the ending words of Dr. Chitty's presentation. If you are stressed about the judgment, put the cup down. You can carry that in your mind for so long that it becomes the most fearful scene that you can anticipate. You can think about standing before the great judge of the universe, so much so that it almost stalemates your heart and makes you pause in frightful intrepidation about what the outcome might be. But tonight, as every other night, I'm not here to tell you how bad you are. You already know that. I'm here to tell you about how good Jesus is. You see, John the Revelator in the book of Revelation presses the pause button on the timeline of prophecy and points us to Revelation's scene in Revelation chapter 14. As Revelation informs us that the long-awaited hour of reckoning has arrived. Let's begin tonight by looking at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. As the revelator in chains says to us, saying with a loud voice, together let's read this tonight, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. I've had to appear in court before, different things, different occasions, and I thank God that I can stand before you today and tell you that my anticipation was far, far more fearful than my actual experience. But if you don't know Jesus, your experience in this setting is going to be much more fearful than your actual anticipation. So there is no greater decision tonight to make than to know that Jesus is your Savior, that we can stand before this great trying hour in which the world has now entered, knowing that we have on our side, the only one that can bring us through this trying ordeal with blessed assurance. 
the Apostle Paul inserts into this timeline a court setting where a divine summons invites us to stand before this heavenly magistrate. We read this in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Notice with me as I share the Apostle's word. He said, for we must, what's the next word? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or whether what? Or whether bad. You see, in the judgment, none is exempt and nothing is excluded. Solomon the wise man also presents before us this judicial scene as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. The Bible continues to agree with itself. And this scene begins to be amplified from one writer to the other. Notice the wise man's word. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. But he doesn't stop there. A man who understands God's justice, but a man who also understands God's mercy. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be what? Or whether it be evil. You know, when you read those words, those three scriptures alone could create within you such a frightening scene and I would su suggest to you that the scene becomes even more frightening. And the number one reason is we ask ourselves, am I ready for such a setting? I've met people in our church that have been members for 10, 20, 30, some 40 years. Some have been generational Christians, generational Adventists. And they say to me, I don't know if I have enough time to get ready for Jesus to come. But I say to them in words of hope, just ask the thief on the cross how much time he needed. When you call on the sufficiency of Christ, you recognize in a very pivotal moment that it's really not about you, it's all about Jesus. Can somebody say amen? amen. You see, Micah the prophet said it, said it in these words, Micah 7, verse 19. He says, when we focus on self, we could be frightened. But notice what he says about the great lover of our souls. He will again have compassion on who? On us. And will subdue our what? Our iniquities. You will cast our sins into the depths of the what? Sea. I don't know if you've done any study about the sea. I've heard about a place called the Marianas Trench. It's in the Pacific, close to some of the Asian islands. And they tell me that the Marianas Trench is so deep that you can put Mount Everest in that portion of the ocean and it will still be from its peak one mile under the surface of that ocean. They said there's, there's a depth that, to which no man can go. You could not, there is no recorded human being that has survived the depths of the Marianas Trench. They've gone there. In mine alone, there are, there are ships, there are fish that exist down there that can't come up here, and there are fish up here that can't go down there. My heart is always comforted when I read that. You know why? Because if the Lord has thrown my sins into that part of the world, you can't find them. Amen? Amen. Amen. And if you talk about it, it doesn't matter, because where it matters, they ain't talking about it. Come on, somebody. There are, other, though, there, are, there are also others that get caught up in the chronology of the judgment. They say, well, when will the judgment begin? Has it begun in 1844? Is an understanding of the 2300 days imperative for salvation? When will the judgment pass from the dead to the living? They get all caught up in these intense studies. And I'm always amazed somebody also comes up, somebody always comes up with a new book about the judgment. And you can study the theology of the judgment all you want, but if you don't know Jesus, theology cannot make a difference in your heart and in your life. What do you say tonight? You've got to know the man of the judgment. Not the details of the judgment, but you've got to know the man of the judgment, and his name is Christ Jesus. And while the answers to these questions are very important, the answer to these questions are not the focus of the judgment. The focus of the judgment is Jesus. Together, the focus of the judgment is Jesus. Focus where Isaiah says our eyes should be. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Let's look at the screen together tonight. Jesus says to us, are you ready? Look to me and be what? And be saved, all you ends of the earth. 
for I am God, and what else? There is no other. There's none like me. There's nobody on earth that no matter where you travel, there's nobody on the planet that can save you but Jesus. We're not saved by wealth. We are not saved by position. We are not saved by education nor financial status. My sister, can you have a seat, please? We're not saved by our position nor our, nor our accomplishments. We are not saved by our achievements. We are saved by the precious blood of that spotless lamb, and his name is Jesus. Amen. That spotless lamb's name, praise God, is Jesus. The writer of Hebrews tells us again, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what did he do? Endured the cross, despising the shame, and what has he done tonight? And has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have got somebody in heaven that's speaking in our behalf. What do you say? Amen. You may feel discouraged about the judgment, but I've got somebody on the inside. His name is Jesus. Come on, somebody. If I didn't have a way, if I did not have anybody to call, I would be in trouble. But I've got somebody on the inside who has taken my name before the Father, who when I call, he answers. And sometimes before I call, he answers. His name is Jesus. He's not sitting down tonight unconcerned about our destiny. He is sitting down tonight mediating to assure our destiny. That's why Jude 1, verse 24 and 25 says, speaking of this judge who's on the inside, now unto him that is able to do what, church? Keep you from falling and to present you how? Faultless before the presence of his glory with what? Exceeding joy to the only wise God and Savior. Together be glory and majesty, dominion and power both when, now, and evermore. Amen, somebody. When Jude wrote that, he put amen, because that's a good word. You see, you've fallen, and you have fallen again, and you have fallen again and again. You may have fallen quite a bit, but I want to tell you, the Lord does not just give us a license to continue falling. He is saying, I can not only forgive your sin, but I can keep you from falling. For sin, is, for sin may be powerful, but the Savior is even more powerful. It's not what we've done, but it's what he's able to do. But the fact of the matter is, when I think about the judgment, I don't have a good strategy. You know what I have? I've got a good lawyer. I've got a good... I, don't, I think about, well, now, how am I going to make it in when I'm standing before someone from which I can hide nothing? He knows the recesses of my heart. He understands my thoughts as they are being developed. He sees my body language and knows where I'm leaning. He understands my word. Every word that we utter, we shall give an account. And he knows how to erase those words and replace them with this word, saved. I read a dream, about, I, read, I read a story about Martin Luther. He, he, he penned his dream that he had when he was learning about justification, righteousness by faith. He said when he had understood this doctrine, he was sleeping one night, and to his mind, this, 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 this urgent picture came. And he saw a scroll being unrolled before him. And on that scroll, all of his sins were listed. And the one holding the scroll was none other than Satan himself. And he was looking at Martin Luther with a smirk, with a smile, almost as though to say, I've got you now. But then all of a sudden appeared in the, screen, in, in the scene in his dream, someone with a large stamp in his hand. He said he did not immediately see the face of this being, but then over every sin that the devil had presented, the word forgiven, pardon, Forgiven. Come on, somebody. Pardon was stamped on every sin. And Martin Luther said, after he woke up from that dream, he understands that the just shall live by faith. And so for those of you who, who are wondering whether or not you got this thing together, the only thing you've got together is you've got to have the best lawyer. You've got to have the best lawyer. Look at 1 John 2, verse 1. I don't have a good strategy, but I got a good lawyer. The Bible says, my little children. What does it say, friends? My little what? Children. My little children. These things I write to you that you may not what? Sin. But if anyone sins, we have what? 
an advocate with the Father. Who is he? Jesus Christ, the righteous. You see, in the judgment, we are not the advocate. Jesus is. We don't appear in the judgment to atone for our sins. Jesus has already atoned for our sins. But when you consider the larger picture, he's not just the judge. He's not just the advocate. He's the lawyer. Now, I want you to get this scene. I mentioned it a few nights ago, but I think it fits right here. When we think about the judgment, we think of the father and the son having a discussion back and forth. We say, we think of Jesus pleading to the father to hold on. We almost see the father as though it's time to cast my judgments and the son saying, not yet, not yet, please wait on. But that's not at all how it is. You see, the father and the son are together in the plan of salvation. The father is not rushing and Jesus is not telling him to wait. But the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So this plan of salvation is a divine plan. But what I like about this text in Daniel 7, 22, and I'll read it. Don't go there yet. What I like about the text I'm going to read is this. Jesus is on both sides of this judicial process. He's our lawyer. He is what? Lawyer. Our lawyer. And then he's also sitting at the judgment bar. He is our judge. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Now, I don't know how he did that, but I don't need to know. Because the Bible says the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. When I was a young pastor, I remember I, I didn't have this right. I remember preaching at one of these tiny churches up in the mountains somewhere. And I talked about the Father being the judge and Jesus being the lawyer. I kind of created almost a, a dichotomy of a competition between who's going to win this argument. And an old saint came to me. That's why God sometimes put us when we are inexperienced in these tiny places <laughs> to get our theology right. Oh, oh, solid elder who had scars and hard hands from years of studying the Bible came to me and said, young man, you don't got the picture right. <laughs> you see, Jesus is both the judge and the lawyer. And I said, I feel a whole lot better now to know that the court is rigged in favor of the children of the Most High God. Come on, somebody, say amen. <laughs> look at Daniel 7, 22. You see, when the judgment is over, a whole lot of stuff is happening, but look at the text. When the judgment is over, here's what the Bible says. Judgment was made in favor of what? The saints of the Most High, and the time came for the who? Saints to possess the kingdom. One day we're going to possess the kingdom. Somebody ought to say amen tonight. One day these hands of mine are going to touch the hand of God. One day these feet are going to walk on golden street. These feet are going to walk on golden streets. I'm going to be able to touch a pearly gate, and I'm going to feel like I don't belong, but Jesus is going to say, come on in. Amen, somebody. I'm going to sit down at a table where a dinner is being prepared for me now, and I know it's going to be good because these ladies that cook can't be better than Jesus. <laughs> now, I tell you, it's good, but it's going to be better in the kingdom. We're going to be sitting at a table with so many seats, but it's going to feel like we're just at the right side of Jesus because when we make it in, we are going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we should not be there other than by the blood of Jesus. Amen. I know I don't have any strategy, but I got a good lawyer. I got somebody who know how to get me in. That's why the prognostications about the birth of Jesus is clear. Matthew, this converted disciple, documented the purpose of his divine mission. Matthew 1, it's clear, and it's still clear today. And the Bible says, and she will bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, Jesus for he might. Yes. He what? Yes. He will save his people from their sins. Hallelujah. Yes. I'm not afraid because I got somebody who know how to will. He says, you're messed up. You got a whole lot of junk in your trunk. You got bad attitudes, but I ain't done yet. Somebody ought to say amen tonight. You got some folk that have been in this building for so long, but I'm trying to, I'm going to get them in there somehow. He's working on us. He's working on our faults and our shortcomings and our failures. He's getting our theology straightened out with our attitudes. He's going to make sure that when this is over, we are going to hear the words, and he's going to be able to say, did I save you from your sins? What a precious Savior. That's why the only decision tonight, when you read that text, he will save his people. The only decision you have to make tonight is make sure you are his people. 
Let him work on the theology of this thing, but you got to make sure you are his people because he's going to save together his people. That's why the judgment hour message is complex in its legal ramifications, but it is simple in its eternal application. Look at 1 John 1, 9. Look at the simplicity of the beauty of the gospel here. He says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful, Faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. I remember spilling something on my carpet. We have a carpet in our place that has been there a long time. You know those carpets have been around a long time? And after a while, they cannot endure any more spills. And you spill stuff and you say, well, it's going to join all the other stains. And I looked, at that carpet with, I, I looked at that carpet with hopelessness. I said to my wife, this carpet probably been here when the man built the house, and maybe he got it from another house, and it looked so old. And I thought, Are there, is there any hope for this carpet? And I tried everything I possibly could to get those stains out, but then I invited a professional to come in. Because our plan was to get rid of that carpet because it just, it's just helpless. A guy came in with a big old gigantic steam apparatus. Long hose from the outside of the house through the living room, and then this big old apparatus. You hear this big motor outside, and the generator just humming away. And all I could see is he's leaning forward and leaning his elbow into that carpet. And when he was done, he said, Don't go, don't go in the living room. Just wait overnight, wait till the next day. And I woke up the next day and I looked at that carpet and said, Honey, this can't be the same carpet. When we stand before Jesus, he's going to say to the angels, This ain't the same carpet. This carpet has been cleaned by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. It's a beautiful message. You see, you can be fearful because you're looking at yourself. But if you look at Jesus, you've heard this before. Somebody said, if I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I can be lost. What do you say? But the problem is sometimes the simplicity and the beauty of the judgment hour message has been overshadowed by the fine print. Consider for a moment the fine print. One of the reasons why we often sign a 30-page contract before we read it. Come on, have you done that before? You know, you're standing in the car dealership and that car is so pretty. They say, just sign right here. And they'd be turning their pages and you're signing your life away. Don't even know what you're signing. The fine print, you get your credit card for the first time. Remember those days when you had to apply for a credit card at a bank? Anybody old enough? Come and help me out, somebody. <laughs> had to go to a bank. Everything is done online now. But still, when you get something online, they have the little checkbox. They said, agree with the terms and conditions. And when you, when you scroll down in the terms and conditions, you ask yourself, how many days do I have to read just the terms and conditions? And so we check it ignorantly because you know why? We don't care about the terms and conditions. We want that credit card. We want that car. We want that house. Our love for that thing is so great that we just check. I agree. But I'm going to tell you, if we love Jesus more than we love that car or that house or that credit card, we can check I agree with the terms and conditions and know that we agree with a just Lord. What do you say? Not somebody that's going to try to find ways to make you lost because the Bible says he is not willing that any should perish. That beautiful story of Joshua, snatched, plucked from the fire. Every time you see a story of salvation in the Bible, you can always be sure that the devil is angry. Anytime anybody is saved from destruction that could come, the devil is angry. You know what? I don't care if he's angry. I'm just glad that God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. For he says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. God is what? Faithful. Who will not allow you or suffer you to be tempted above which you are able. But with every temptation, what does he do? He makes a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So it's not just about being forgiven. We have to consider the fact that if we love him so much, if we love him so much, he's not going to change on us. He's not going to change. And I can tell you something. When you get that car, it's going to change. Anybody know what I'm talking about? My wife and I have a car from 1994. 
It's got 201,000 miles on it. It still works. Now, now, we got a newer car, but I'm keeping that car as a reminder of where we came from. <laughs> Honey, look at that car. And when I turn the key, it just hum, yum, yum, yum. <laughs> hums like a preacher that want to preach. It hums beautifully. It reminds me of how many miles God has been faithful. That's how God is. That's why I'm so glad the car change and the house is going to need repairs. And you may exceed your credit limit, but Jesus, in Hebrews 13, verse 8, the Bible says, Jesus Christ, here it is, is the same yesterday, today, and for how long? Forever. He loves us today. He's going to love us tomorrow. If we call on him for forgiveness today, he will. If we call him tomorrow, he will. Somebody ought to say amen. Not only that, he says, when everything and everyone has disappointed you, and when you feel deserted... Look at Hebrews 13, verse 5. He says this to us. Those of us who are in pain and hurting, he says, I will, come on, never leave you nor forsake you. Who do you know that can say that? Only God can say that. Only the Lord can say that. That's why this judgment hour is a clear message. You see, in the judgment hour message, we don't have to represent ourselves. Jesus is the one that represents us. The belief that we are on trial is true to a certain degree. But follow me carefully tonight. The, the belief that we are on trial is true to a certain degree. But first we have to look at the facts. Are you ready to look at the facts? Here it is. What if they examined your life to find out how righteous you are? What would the conclusion be? Isaiah 64, verse 6. Let's look at some facts about ourselves. If they examined your life about your righteousness, how true would this be of you? Here's what the Bible says. For we are all like a what? Unclean thing. And how much? All our righteousnesses are like what? Filthy rags. We all fade as a what? Leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have done what? Taken us away. So if your righteousness, sorry, if our righteousness was on trial, would there be any righteousness on our own to be found? Okay, so, so, so let's just put that to rest right away. You will never be, sister, you will never be righteous enough to be saved. Let me not bring you into the picture. I'll never be righteous enough to be saved. But I'm so glad that ain't the only verse in the Bible. Look at Jeremiah 33, verse 16. You see, it is not about our righteousness. It's about the one who stands in our behalf. Let's look at the one who is righteous. Jeremiah the prophet says, In those days, Judah will be what? Saved. And Jerusalem will dwell how? Safely. And this is the name by which she will be called. Are you ready? The Lord our righteousness. Who's your righteousness? What is the name? The Lord our righteousness. The Lord is the one by which we find our righteousness. That's a beautiful thing because you know what? I have a lot of traits from my parents. You know, I don't want to belittle the message at all. I don't want to take it to a human level, but you can look at yourself and you can tell, well, he's got a face like his mother. He's got ears like his daddy. He's got the height from somebody in his family. Something about us resembles our parents. The beauty of the gospel is this. One day we are going to be just like our father and his name is Jesus. Amen. That's why if Satan accused me of my righteousness, if, if Satan said of me, John is no good, do you know that he would be right? Look at Paul the Apostle. For whatever reason, Paul the Apostle agrees with the enemy on this statement. The Bible says in Romans 3 and verse 10, as it is written, let's all read that together. Are the saints ready? There is what? None righteous, no, not one. So, so much for the fact that you need more time to work out your salvation. Some people say, Pastor, you know, I, you know, I got a whole lot of issues. Well, I want to tell you, you might know that, but God also knows that. And then sometimes we don't even spend time on our issues. We say, Sister, so-and-so got a lot of issues. <laughs> Looking at other people's issues. In the time of judgment, you better examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. 
You need to stand before the mirror that reveals your condition before God so that you can know where you stand and what need you have of Christ. You see, the fact of the matter is Satan magnifies our faults. He underlines our failures. He amplifies our weaknesses. And then he broadcasts our character malfunctions. Everybody knows when you mess up. And for whatever reason, church members like to, you know, when, when, when something goes good, nobody knows about it. I wish some of you would make phone calls to talk about the good news. Amen? Yeah. Oh, I've been on the phone for four hours. I, I'm always praying it was a four-hour Bible study, but in most cases, it's not. The pastor messed up this week. Uh-huh, the deacon done blew it. And we talk about junk. Brethren, don't talk about junk. I said to my church members, I said to those people that love Facebook, I wish to God people would use Facebook to talk about Jesus. Yeah. Stop, stop putting your junk on Facebook. As if people don't know enough about you already. And then, when you, when they, and then when you get tired of talking about yourself, you just choose a church member to talk about. That's what the devil does. He amplifies our faults. He underlines our failures. He magnifies our weaknesses. And then he broadcasts our character malfunctions. So being accused by the devil and being overcome by Satan are not the same thing. Being accused by the devil and being overcome by Satan are not the same thing. But to accuse is what Satan does. That's why I love it when Revelation says, the accuser of our brethren who accuse you before our God day and night has been cast down. He's been kicked out. He would stand in heaven accusing everybody. He loves to accuse. So when we fall into that category, we fail to realize that being accused is one thing, but being overcome is another. The devil does a good job. He's supposed to accuse us, but we don't have to be overcome by the power of the enemy because the power of God is greater. Amen. Our advocate is greater than our adversary. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Jehovah Nissi is more powerful than our nemesis. Jehovah Nissi, Jesus is my banner. Our delivering archangel is superior to our scandalous arch enemy. We've got a savior that has never lost. How many people will bet? Now, I'm not going to do this. I don't talk about betting. But if you are a gambling person, would you bet on somebody that you know loses over and over and over again? But how good would you feel if you were to bet on somebody that never lost? Well, we don't have to bet tonight because with Jesus, there is no gamble. But Jesus is a sure thing. That's why Paul the Apostles in Romans 8 and verse 31, he says these words. Oh, I love these words. What then shall we say of these things? Come on together. If God is for us, who can be against us? If he's for us, who's going to hit you? When I was in high school, a little young man just going to, I, I left, I was in public high school. I used to be a little puny kid. Please don't say anything. <laughs> I used to be skinnier than this. And I remember entering high school, tough high school in Brooklyn, New York. Bad high school where they had fights almost every other day. Fighting the teachers, setting a classroom on fire, beating up kids outside of school. I was absent, I was absent from school that year, 42 days. I just wouldn't go. I was just tired of being picked on, wouldn't go. So one day my sister caught me playing hooky and she said, why don't you go to school? I said, I'm afraid to go. She said, why? I said, because somebody stole my bus pass. They give you a pass to take the bus for free. I said, God stole my bus pass. She said, who? I gave her his name. She said, I'm coming to your school tomorrow. My big sister brought her friend, another big girl. Amen, big ladies. Hey, <laughs> hey. <laughs> she came up with a, with a supercharged Brooklyn attitude. Who is he that took your bus pass? There he is. And she said, go hit him in the chest. I said, hit him in the chest? I got to go to school here when you go back to where you came from. She said, if you only hit him, I'm going to hit you. Well, that will change a whole lot of things. So before I was converted, I went and, you know, found all the little skinny muscles I had and hit him with all I had. And she looked at him and she said, don't you ever take anything from my brother. You got that? I found out that my sister was better than, I won't give his name. <laughs> he might be watching this. He might be converted by now. I found out my sister was badder than my nemesis. I want to tell you, Jesus is badder than my sister. And she's still bad. 
She works for the police department in New York City and the fire department. She that bad. If you get arrested, she'll process you. If your house is on fire, she'll help put it out. That's how, that's how it works. Jesus can do both things. He can, he can light you up and cool you down when you need to be. That's why let's, let's pause for a moment. Let's, let's just adjust real quickly. Now, what's true about Adam and Eve is also true about us. If we go back to the beginning, to the first transgression of our parents, there's a powerful parallel between sin, salvation, judgment, and victory that is also true about us. Let's look at that very quickly. Are you ready? Here we go. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9. It's true about them. It must be true about us. Now, the reason I'm going back to Adam and Eve is this. You see, this plan of salvation at first applied just to two people. To how many? Two. Now it, now it has applied to billions. But... The plan of salvation for Adam and Eve is the same plan of salvation for you and for me. Same plan. But let's look at this. What's the first thing the Lord did when they sinned? Here it is. Genesis 3 and verse 9. And the Lord said, the Lord called to Adam and said to Adam, what did he say? Where are you? Good news of the judgment is when Adam fell into sin, Jesus came looking for Adam. Adam did not have to go looking for Jesus. Jesus came looking for Adam which is true about who he is. The very first thing that the Lord does for us, the reason why the Lord came to this earth to find us, the Bible says, Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what? That which was lost. The first, the first truth about the judgment is this, the commitment of Jesus in four words, I will find you. And you know what, friend? He don't find us to accuse us. Because we already know what we've done. He didn't say to Adam, you know what? I don't know why I made you. He could have said, Adam, you are a poor representative of this earth. He could, he could have said, as a matter of fact, I'm doing this over. I ain't making no more men like you. Let me get this thing done all over. But he came to Adam, and look at the next thing he did. Genesis 3 and verse 13. First he comes to us. First he does what, friends? He what? He, co he comes to find us. He doesn't wait for us to try to find him. He comes to find us in our sin. The Bible says, Genesis 3 and verse 13, the next thing Jesus does is this. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The second thing he does when he finds us, Brother Elder, is this. He asks us to confess, what have you done? Because, because it's a fact. If we confess, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive. But you got to confess. You see, in order to appreciate the forgiveness, you have to understand and know and admit to what you've been forgiven from. So when you say, oh, I forgive you, some people say, well, I forgive you, and they say, for what? What have I done? That's why you should never say to somebody, if I offended you, I'm sorry. That means you're not even sorry because you haven't even agreed that you offended me. <laughs> You got to agree that you did something just in case I did get you upset. I'm sorry. That's not an apology. That's, that's a glass with holes in it. Can't hold water. Amen, somebody. The Lord leads us to confess so we can know Proverbs 28 and verse 13. And the, and the wise men later on began to put all these parameters of Genesis into the other portions of the Scripture. Here's what... Proverbs says, tw Proverbs 28, verse 13, the Bible says, he who covers his sin, what? Will not prosper. But whoever does what? Confesses and what else? Forsakes. Them will have what? Mercy. You got to first admit you need to be forgiven. But you got to not only ask for forgiveness, you got to forsake that thing. Because God is not into what they call recidivism, which is mean some people over and over and over and over. It's like, will you ever be delivered? I believe that God is a greater deliverer than Satan is a deceiver. But the third thing he did in that garden that is a message to us today, look at verse 21 of Genesis chapter 3. Let's move with expedition. The third thing he did is he provides atonement and righteousness. Notice what he did. Unto Adam, the Bible says, also unto his wife, did the Lord God make what? Coats of skin. And what else did he do? He clothed them. In the Bible, when you read about God putting clothes on anybody, it's a symbol of his righteousness. See, they made aprons. God said, you ain't coming to church in an apron. Come on, help me out somebody. 
<laughs> now, I'm not going to go there tonight. But God knows that the way we dress ourselves and the way he clothes us is quite a different story. Which means, as Isaiah 4, 1, the declaration they made in Isaiah 4, it's not a text. He says, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. There are folk today that have their own standard of righteousness. The standard of righteousness is God's Ten Commandments. But he says to us, I'll cover you. I will clothe you. Look at Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Here's how the Bible amplifies what's found in the book of Genesis. The prophet says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be what? Joyful in my God. Why can we rejoice tonight about where we are in Jesus together? For he has done what? Clothe me with garments of what? Salvation. What else has he done? He has what? Covered me with a robe of righteousness. And he did that by killing an animal. And I would suggest to you, the evidence I have so far is the first animal that was slain was slain to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. That's why John, in the end of the Bible, says, Jesus, Revelation 13, 8, is the lamb slain from the what? Foundation of the world. The same thing that needed to happen in Genesis is still available in Revelation. But let's look at the fourth thing. He not only atones and covers us, but he assures eternal victory over Satan and sin. Genesis 3 and verse 15. It's amazing. The entire plan of salvation is in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15, the Bible says, this is the assurance text. I will put what? Enmity, look what up, between you and the woman. And between what? Your seed and what? Her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his what? Heal. Now, sister, keep that up there for a moment. I want you to notice something on the screen. Look at the word between. Bring it back up there. There it is. The word between has a capital B. The word seed has a capital S. Let me suggest to you tonight, in my theological research, I discovered, thank you, Jesus. I didn't discover anything. He revealed it to me. I, 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 I learned for the first time, my brothers and sisters, that this is the first time in history that Jesus was introduced as the man called between. <laughs> Woo! This is deep. Are you ready for it? Because he's the one that's between heaven and hell, between us being lost and saved, between us staying in darkness or coming into life. He's the man between. But let me make my case clear. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 15, look at what the Bible says. For there is one God and one mediator, what's the next word? Between God and men, that man who? Christ Jesus. He's the between God. Can somebody say amen? amen? You were here, and then you met the man between, and he took you here. But let's not stop there. I need some more evidence. I'm, that's what you're asking for. Genesis 31, verse 49, look what the Bible says. Abraham said this to his cousin Lot. The Lord watch where? Between me and thee, while we are what? absent one from another. The man between earth and heaven is Jesus. That's why it's sad when people pray to Mary. Mary can't do it. I need my breath for something else. Mary can't help you. There ain't, there ain't enough beads that you can pray to get help from Mary. First of all, she did not survive her death. She was chosen by God to be the delivery for Jesus, not to be eternal like Jesus. That's why when you see these statues of big Mary and little Jesus, it's like, like he never grew up. Oh, my brothers and sisters, he grew up. He's the almighty one. Somebody say amen. He's the one that's sitting on the right hand of Father. There is no lady up there. That's why you should never pray Mother God. There is no Mother God. His name is Jesus, the man Christ Jesus. That's why the earthly sanctuary services had to end. You see, Jesus died because this sanctuary service was a constant symbol of what was between earth and heaven. And when this earthly service accomplished its purpose, it was no longer needed to be between us and God. 
Here's the reason. Let me break it down. The earthly priest could never be sinless like our high priest Jesus. Isn't that right? The earthly lamb could never be as spotless as Jesus. The only blood that could atone for our sin is the blood of who? Jesus. The only water that can wash us away, the only bread that can satisfy the hungry soul, the only candle that can bring light to us in this dark world, his name is Jesus. Jesus. That's why the Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 2 and verse 14. For he is our what? Peace. Who hath broken down both, who had made both one, and how did he do it? And hath broken down the what? Middle wall of partition where between us. The sanctuary services, they're those folk that think they need to go back and, 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 and keep the feasts. You need to keep Jesus. There are people that are talking about, we need to go back and keep the feasts. Some people don't even know how to keep the commandments yet. And now they're trying to impose on you, we need to keep the feasts. Well, I'm going to tell you, Jesus is our Passover supper. Jesus is our Passover lamb. He is the one by which we are saved. His blood was shed. You can't keep any feasts to be saved. You're only saved by the merits of Christ. That's why Jesus did something else. Number five, Jesus provided forgiveness for and power over. That's why the same grace that Jesus gave to Mary, he gives to us. Notice what he said to this woman who was cast at his feet. John 8 and verse 11. John 8 and verse 11. Let's go quickly. He said to her, neither do I do what? Condemn, condemn thee. Go and do what? Sin no more. Now, he said to her, I don't condemn you. And let me say this tonight. The judgment is not for the purpose of condemning his children. Even though it begins at the house of God, 1 Peter 4, 17, it is not for the purpose of killing his children. It is for the purpose of vindicating his children. And by the way, when you say the judgment, the hour of his judgment has come, get this right. The accusation that Satan made was not against us. The accusation that Satan made was against Christ. So if Satan proves Christ to be a liar, we are all lost. But when Jesus is vindicated, so are we. Amen. If you're in him and he's vindicated, you got it made. When he's declared righteous, so are we. The judgment is terrifying if you don't have Jesus as your judge. It can be frightening if you don't have him as your lawyer. It can be fearful if you don't know him as your savior. Point number six, Jesus removes the fear of the judgment. Jesus removes the fear of the judgment. You see, if I represented myself in the judgment, I could tell you the outcome, I would be lost. But let's listen to the writer of Hebrews once again. Tonight, I haven't come to tell you how bad you are. I've come tonight to introduce you to my lawyer. Is that all right? Yes. Hebrews 7, verse 25. Let's move on. You can begin playing softly, Brother Neville. You can begin praying, playing softly that song. Softly and tenderly, whichever, whatever I told you to pray. You just play that softly on the piano. Tonight, listen to my lawyer. Listen to his resume. Here's what he says. This is his resume. Are you ready for it? The Bible says, therefore, Hebrews 7, 25, therefore, he is able to save to the what? Uttermost. Those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to make what? Intercession for them. Only Jesus tonight, friends. Only Jesus can save you, as we say in New York, from the guttermost to the uttermost. Only Jesus can do that. That's why I'm not preaching about what I can do. I'm preaching about what Jesus can do. Let me tell you what else. I got some other people in the Bible to testify. I asked Isaiah, and he said to me, who can turn a profane man into a prophet? And Isaiah said, Jesus can. So I said, Peter, what do you have to say? Peter said, who can turn a liar into a preacher? Peter said, Jesus can. So I went to David. That man that went to bed with Bathsheba. And I said, David, who can turn an adulterer into the Son of God? And he said, Jesus can. But I didn't stop there. I said, Rahab, who can turn a prostitute into an evangelist? And she said, Jesus can. If you don't believe me, ask my cousin, the woman at the well. She has the same testimony. Who can turn a persecutor into a soul winner? Paul said, uh, ask Saul. <laughs> He turned Saul into Paul. He said, you got to ask Saul because I'm the one that's been delivered. Come on, somebody, say amen tonight. You see, Jesus knows that our character cannot endure the judgment. 
And his entire mission can be summed up very simply. He covers us. I got to get this in. This is my closing two texts. He cover, are you ready? He covers us with his righteousness. He covers us with his righteousness while he works on our character. So if you don't look like him yet, hold on. You ever seen those houses? Not too far from here, there's a building covered from top to bottom in cloth. You see what I'm talking about? When they construct, I notice in London, they cover stuff with cloth. You can't see what's going on on the inside, but one day the cloth is no longer there and you say, wow. I was wondering what they were doing all those months. Matter of fact, in some cases, years. And they removed the drapery and they said, wow. One day, God is going to remove the drapery of your sin, and you're going to look like this. Let's, let's get some evidence. Here we go. 1 John 3 and verse 1 and 2. Here's what the Bible says. Beloved, come on, together. Beloved, when? Now. Beloved, when? Now. Beloved, when? Now. now we are the children of God. When are we God's children? Now. Tonight. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. He's still working on me. But here's the word of assurance. But we know, together with me, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Why? <laughs> Woo. They're going to take that curtain away. They're going to say, John, is that you? Brother Paul, is that you? Brother Head, is that, is that our head? The same guy that was in Croydon? Yes, it is. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And finally... The judgment is not to bring fear in our hearts, but to bring blessed assurance. I've got to give it to you. 1 John 4, verse 17, my last text. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we when in this world. Right now. Now, I don't know if you caught that. We are like Jesus because of his righteousness right now. He's covered us. So when the father sees his son reflected, he accepts us in behalf of the righteousness of his son. He sees his son. Brother Paul, when the Lord looks at you, he sees his son.